Welcome everyone to a new episode here at Lighting Rot. Uh, today you get to see me with a big headset, mostly because I forgot to change it. Today uh, was a big party yesterday at work, so I came up home drunk at 3 a.m. in the morning, so I've been tired all day. So excuse me ahead of time. But today we have a special guest. Actually, as a requested by you guys, you wanted to get some more knowledge about ACs, color grading, and I've been like looking for the right person. And, you know, I stumbled upon Andreas, who has been doing it for a very, very, very long time. He's actually quite famous on the, is it East Side? East Side, yeah, like Asia, Turkey, India, done a lot of Netflix, Amazon Prime movies, TV show, very big, big people, big, big acting movies. Uh, all those things we're going to talk about it so we get to explore these topics today uh keep in mind i don't have a lot of knowledge about aces which i should hence he's here and color grading which i have been exploring a bit as you know so today we get actually a professional who can educate us, us a bit and tell us his practices and his knowledge around these things uh, as usual uh we'll just take it uh, as we go and feel free to ask your question as well and i'll ask them uh, when it gets started so please andreas welcome uh how are you hello Ed. thanks for having me i'm well nice to be here <laughs> yeah happy to have yeah, you nice introduction. yeah nice introduction <laughs> yeah no problem uh i like your setup you know you're like in uh, in this uh explain to people what room you are sitting in right now i'm in a di cinema grading room and uh, at the moment i'm in abu dhabi so next to dubai and we're it's a base of my workplace i'm in a post-production and we have two of these rooms uh they have a base light in there i think most of you guys know davinci resolve and the more expensive system is a base light and we have two of them and uh behind me yeah you, let me maybe see it a little bit there's this little window in the back there's yeah. a projector inside um if you make cinema films otherwise we're on the monitor nice so uh andreas let's uh let's uh introduce people a little bit more about your background. I mean, you've been around for a while. Uh, you have had quite a journey and choices over the years. So let's start a little bit with, you know, how you got started as a colorist and why you chose to be a colorist and, uh, yeah, things you have learned over the years because you've been doing it for, well, as a colorist anyway, you've been doing it since 2006. Uh, I was studying as a, as a 3D designer at the time when you were already busy with doing uh, colorist. And I was studying 3D before, actually. Uh, I wanted to become a 3D artist. And then I I worked on one, two projects. I worked at, I don't know if you know the company, Scanline in Germany. Yeah. As a trainee. And then I realized, yeah, there's guys so much better than me. And I wanted to do the same like you, lighting, rendering. Um, but uh, so I realized at one point, if you don't know how to script properly and you will never become a TD. And so my second interest was becoming a colorist. And there was actually on the the same ground so there, there was here scanline and let's say 20 50 meters away was another company uh post production and uh, so i asked those guys hey can i start with you and uh, so i became a colorist nice That's how it started in germany yeah. uh apologies ahead of time with all the um, background noises i i'm guessing you also can hear it andreas cops and stuff i live in the middle of no, london so, so it's London, middle in the middle of London. So you're gonna hear ambulance, uh, fire truck, cops every ten minutes or something. So I apologize ahead of time. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to know what's happened after this, right? Yeah. So uh, I learned for for about three years, uh, actually on film, on literally on on film, material film, and then slowly went on to digital. In I was freelancing across Europe, and in 2010 I got the offer to go to Turkey. Actually, two companies offered me uh, to do commercials in Turkey. I did this for almost four years. It was crazy because I worked up to, I don't know, six commercials a day in the hot season. Um, in these four years, maybe had a thousand commercials. And after this, I needed a break. I uh, didn't want to work on commercials anymore because, you know, it's in, out, in, out, in, out all the time. And I got the offer to go to Malaysia because the biggest Japanese post-production partnered up with Pinewood Studios and they had a joint venture. So they needed someone um, to do the color grading and they had a cinema like this, but with, I think, 100 seats in there. It was was quite good. Uh, I stayed there for two and a half years and then I got offered to go to India. Um, ended up in India four years in uh, FutureWorks. 
it's a company with I think 300 people, a lot of VFX artists who work on international stuff, um, local stuff and international stuff. Um, and yeah, after four years, so right after the actually in the middle of the pandemic, and I got the offer to go to the UAE, Dubai, and they had a nice plan to open up a OTT platform, a streaming platform, like Netflix for the Pan Arabic market and had a huge funding and uh, so we produced a little bit i was i took a double position as a creative director so i was involved in front and at the back end at the post production and we can talk about this i think and this was the plan so the streaming platform at one point went off they decided different so now i'm in the post production part which is still there that's that's the deal nice um quick hello to it's ninja thank you for watching uh jeremy has a comment for us that aces is a rabbit hole that needs some clear documentation so many people get easily confused by it nowadays well mm -hmm. jeremy hopefully today andreas can shed some lights into it because i obviously don't have much knowledge about it and i'll probably ask the stupid question so um andreas let's also clarify what the colorist do what is a colorist what's and also in your case you know what's your work like your task when do you start when do you responsibility end? i do want to point out to people that even though he started as a colorist um, currently he is a creative director of visuals and chief colorist he's also a book author so a lot of our questions are gonna intertwine a little bit as we talk uh even though i'm gonna try and keep them specific uh we will be going a little bit back and forth so yeah colorist andreas uh, what's uh oh, what's the task uh, what in a nutshell, Photoshop for video. Photoshop, wow, that was very good and quick. If no one, someone has no idea, say Photoshop for video. But basically what happened, you know, they shoot a film or the same scene over a couple of weeks sometimes. They shoot it in week one and, and again in, in week five. And But in the film, it has to look like it's it's one scene. The guy is going out of the door and can't be snow suddenly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. What I mean? And um, so I, the, one of the first parts is you have to match the shots. They have to look the same seamless the second part you create a look which works for the entire film or some scenes let's say you the one part plays in new york you have a special look for new york which is also not overwhelming or most guys who think about color grading they think you do crazy looks all the time no most of the time you shouldn't see the look you should concentrate on the acting and all those stuff so i'm supporting basically the the creative side i'm uh, supporting the story um and you can do this on commercials you can do this on feature films basically everything what is video and um yeah so that's color grading that's what i'm doing and on commercials you bring the product out for example if there's a coca-cola can you make the coca-cola exactly in the right ci color um i'm working on faces i key faces i do sometimes beauty touch-ups which before was only possible um in compositing on a flame on a, on a nuke and now all the, even from Da Vinci Baselight, they all have basically tools where you can touch up a little bit. Um, so it turned more into a little bit of a compositing tool, of course, not a full compositing tool. I, I do relighting also on 3D scenes. Um, I can de th put 3D objects in. I'm limited with that, but that's what a lot what I do. I mask things, I mask the background. Um, you see here, for example, those my glasses and some people might not see them because the monitor is too dark some people might see the difference between black and black or you see the reflection here um so i have to decide how much do you want to see how my face would be now over overexposed your face maybe underexposed so i have to balance this out also two shots so like two actors the one guy can't be bright the other guy can't be dark and have a red face so right. that's kind of what i'm doing as a, as a colorist there's a lot of stuff though to keep track of so let's uh talk a little bit about the tone and the mood that you have to make sure is consistent is there a brief you get from from someone like this is the color this is the lot this is this is what we want or is it more to us given you you have the freedom to kind of choose the colors like in our background background stream you have orange and and there's a there's kind of a teal lighting i guess on set do, do, do you try and copy that across the scenes then because you can see there's a color palette on set or do you do something different how does that work that's that's a lot now um basically let's say in the old times when um 
color grading, digital color grading was quite new because color timing is there for the last hundred years since there's film. So what happened, uh, they shoot the film, they come to you in the end and okay, make something nice. In the worst case, it happened, we want a look like that, like CSI, and you say, yeah, but dude, why didn't you shoot it like that? So meanwhile, over the last 10 years, I mean, this has changed a lot. Um, the team comes, the cinematographer comes for tests. Uh, we talk about lenses, we talk about the camera, what combination, what kind of light. There's a lot of testing before and a lot of discussion, but uh, the colorist, meanwhile, gets really into the game quite early. And um, then basically they go out shooting. Sometimes they send a test. Are we still in the right zone? What do you think? Is it too dark? Is it too bright? And later on, in the ideal case, you get something which is already in the zone. So if you want, for example, something which looks like a thriller movie and look, should be cool and uh, cyan, you wouldn't choose colors like that. So it's later, it's always better to do it in, on set than me later on. So if a colorist says, it's my color palette, it's actually more or less the color palette on set, which you try to enhance a little bit. So now in my position, because um, I'm working in a lot of production companies, sometimes I'm, that's really a, a special thing for a colorist because we come in the end. I'm in now very often in the beginning with production companies, with the producer already, sometimes even before the director. And uh, I get the script, I analyze the script, where can we go? Uh, I shortlist some DOPs, um, which might work for the script and this look where we think, where I think it, it could go. Um, sometimes the director or the producer, they suggest someone, I say, ah, I don't think this guy would work for this kind of script and this look, or he would work, or yes, of, of course, so I'm just advising. And um, then basically I work with the DOP very close. Again, we talk about all this technical stuff from, um, from lenses, camera, which light. So we find a brooch I support, because you must think like a DOP, not in Hollywood, on, on smaller scales, like a two to five, ten million dollar movie, uh, where there's less pre-production. He's mostly on his own. And he has to take care of so much stuff from technology to um, to the design. Sometimes he's helping, or he's sometimes even very influenced uh, in the production design, uh, technology, the framing. So. That's quite cool if when the DOP has a guy, he can basically exchange himself a little bit about where do we go. And then in the next step, I go on set, which also usually a colorist doesn't do. So I go on set, I help them, especially if they want to shoot for HDR, because in HDR, you have to take care of highlights, uh, especially you can't overexpose. The ratio between the highlights has to match. So you can't say, let's say in the background, if there would be a window behind me, this is five stops over and your face is like that. So, because then this would basically blast away and your face would still be okay. So the ratio has to be in, in order. And that's kind of, if someone has never made HDR and shot for HDR, they don't know exactly what's the fine tuning. Or I go, I was on the set and have dimmed down all the monitors or I went with a black paint and painted all the tube lights. So this little stuff where I'm basically helping them adjust for the first few days, I create a show lot, which means I create a lot on set based on the lighting. Um, and this is the final lot basically for the show. I mean, there can be two or three for different scenes and different locations, but I always bring them to shoot through this lot. So they see on the set, on the monitor, what's the final look or very close to the final look. And, um, if something looks like shit, then basically I will not do a color grading later on or on set. Now you change your light. So if the guy is dark, change the light. If the guy is too bright, change the light or change the exposure. So that's a very, uh, I would say, American Hollywood approach where you, you have to show lot. That's what Netflix actually introduced, in my opinion. Um, you shoot through this lot and you see on the dailies, you find look. Dailies is the stuff which you shoot uh, every day. Let's say per day you shoot one hour. So after this, it goes to the lab on set and they upload it in, in a proxy quality so everyone can watch it on his phone, on his iPad. And basically 15 people can, can comment, it looks good or it doesn't look good. So and then later on, when it comes to color grading, I actually have an easier job um, because the look is basically already set through the light, through the production design, through makeup, through costumes. So that's the ideal case. The worst case is like 10 years ago, they just shoot and come and 
make it like this because this will never work makes sense so when it comes to this exposure you're talking about overexposing underexposing as a colorist did you learn about this while you were a colorist early on did you do photography to keep up with all of these terminology practicalities because you mentioned on set you mentioned uh exposure under exposure you mentioned um uh, stuff on 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 set that you need to understand and things that are often uh, picked up when you are learning to work on set as a assistant or uh, you know as an assistant for a director of photographer and stuff like that so how did you pick up on these skills uh, uh, and should every colorist pick up on these skills to be able to I, do I, the job i think so in my opinion yes uh, i learned a lot on the job everything everything on the job um if i don't know anything i'm googling i'm watching youtube videos but i learned from the best dops over asia so they tell me, hey, I use this exposure here, you use this light there. When you hear it over and over, you get a feeling what they used. And then going on set is, is, is another game changer, or was a game changer for me. Because then I finally understood what I later get on, on my monitor, how it plays together in, in, in production. And um, then we, and you have to talk the same language with the DUP. Um, you can't just say, make it brighter, make it darker. And so give me a stop more, give me a stop uh, less or something. And this helped me so much. It was basically learning on the job and then personal interest, um, getting a feeling for things. That's how. Cool. So any advice for people who are not necessarily becoming a colorist, but are required or need to edit their videos for images, maybe not on the same professional level as you, but you know, they maybe have a project or maybe there's a, a pre-rendered video for a personal game they're doing. Um, what are some of the best practices uh, uh, that is required to do the bare minimum of color grading for someone like like me who have zero experience and I, I'm running out something in Unreal Engine, as I said to you earlier in private, or Unity Engine, or 3D animation from Maya, and I need to right. tweak something. I don't know what's wrong. I know something is wrong, and I know from talking to you, okay, there's something I can do in, in color grading to fix the exposure or the color or the contrast. So the bare minimum is don't do color grading. <laughs> do it do it in your comp setup. Do it, uh, basically choose your design already like you. You're already in the right zone. Like you, let's say if you're in a warm zone, which would be on the color wheel maybe here, you can't go in this direction cold. It wouldn't work. It looks like shit. So be in the right zone, choose your color palette already when you produce it, when you render it, in your case, 3D animation or uh, in the comp. And then when it comes to color grading, I mean, I prefer my shots to be raw or log. So very flat, non-saturated, because then I have the most range. That's why I like ACES also, because I've, it gives me the most range. If you give me something in a wrong codec, like I think we discussed it before, like MP4, there's no range because it's it's a limited range format or codec. Um, if you give me something very contrasty, you can't do anything. It's like if it's contrasty already, you can't do anything. So another mistake people do, they put random LUTs, which they think might look good. And for this shot, this LUT, for this shot, that LUT. Yeah, but this doesn't have a base, you know, because usually if something is already contrasty, you just make it a little bit more contrasty, you play a little bit, but don't do too much. That's some people overdo it. Um, that's if you let's say if you don't want to learn color grading, that's what I would be my advice. So let's talk about that. You just mentioned MP4 ACs. Uh, maybe there's some other stuff you didn't mention. What's the difference? Like, what, what, what are we talking about specifically here when you talk about codecs, different codec range? Because uh, you need the range to edit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So, okay, where do, where do we start? Um, so basically, let's say 10 years ago, people in post-production used DPX. I, still, I think still today people use DPX. 8-bit um, in the worst case, now 10-bit. And until I would say three, four years ago, I've still seen, DP even today I still see DPX. I usually prefer EXRs. They are way bigger. That's why a lot of post guys don't want to work with them, especially in 4K. I mean, they get, they get super big. I don't know, a 4K... Uh, EXR is maybe, maybe 35, 40 um, megabytes per frame. So you can imagine it gets big. So 
but if you want to work in a format like ACES, and I will explain in a second what's ACES, then you need EXRs. You can't render in DPX. Um, I've seen a lot of guys who try to fake it, so I give them ACES EXRs, and they internally convert it because it's easier for them into DPX and then just render out EXRs again. And then when I get it back, I get all the highlights cut. So they're, they're all dull, they're not there anymore. If I lose the details, that's when I understand, okay, they tried to fake it, but didn't understand the whole workflow because you have to work in EXRs, 16-bit at least. Um, so what is ACES? Um, ACES is a format developed by the Academy of Motion Pictures, and they tried to make a standard and made a standard. It's, I think it's awesome, where you can change files. First of all, it's interchange format. We can change files from, for example, VFX to grading or to VFX without losing quality. So now the, the issue with ACES, or the, let's, let's go for the benefits first. ACES has around 32 stops of dynamic range. It's not that you use a LUT, which is ACES, or it's in a system. So ACES can only work in, yeah, honestly, I'm not sure. We've tried it once and failed, but um, in Nuke, in a color grading system, that's basically where you use ACES. So then uh, 32 stops of dynamic range, and it's a format. If you render it in ACES, because it's so wide and the color space is so wide that, let's say, I take it out in 20 years, there still is probably no monitor which can take this whole color space. So. At one point, you have to take this huge color space, of course, in your timeline and bring it down to uh, to a display format, which is, for example, Rec. 709, which is a or sRGB or something. But in my tool, which can be Nuke, which can be a flame, which can be a baseline, which can be Resolve, I want to work in the most possible dynamic range. And this is, for me, ACES. So now the thing is with ACES, you bring basically, let's say, from my perspective, from a color grading, I have a camera footage, which is, let's say, a raw footage, very flat. Um, there's no color on top. There's no saturation on top from a Alexa, a real Alexa. Bring it into my timeline. My timeline is based on ACES. It's not a display timeline. So there are two ways, two kinds of timelines. And the one is a display referred one, where you say, okay, I limit my timeline to what is the monitor or what is the output. If it's a projector, a monitor, but this is all display referred, means it's shrinked down. I want a scene referred timeline, which means I have the full range and can't even use the full range because there's no camera which can fill it out at the moment. So the best cameras have maybe 16 stops dynamic range. So if 32 stops, you can never fill it out, which is a good thing. So I'm in this huge uh, timeline and then I go on a display color space when I go out on the monitor. So, and what they did in the Academy of Motion Pictures, they have developed it um, kind of like film. So they wanted a filmic approach. So the middle part, the way it looks, that's called DRT and display rendering transform. And this part is actually not rendered when I give it to, to you guys, uh, to the VFX and the 3D guys. So the, it's you could say it's a lot. It's the look. But I don't render this look on it. I render always without the look. So when I give you my ACES CC or CG files, you don't have that. And um, that's a good thing because you can choose then the look and I can choose the look. There are a couple of different looks. The issue is now, and that's what a, a lot of people struggle, especially in VFX, this look is very contrasted because it's designed to look like film. So when you get it into your, let's call it, let's say Nuke, and you put this DRT on top, you can choose which one. Um, suddenly the image, and especially if it's a very dark image, like maybe behind me, you know, kind of that dynamic range, it gets even darker. And that's, that's the big issue where a lot of VFX guys are struggling. I've seen this. And there's a workaround. You could give a, a CDL or what I did, especially for Nuke, I tell everyone, okay, get the baselight plugin. I give you a baselight BLG file, which chooses already which kind of DLT, so which look you want, and my grading on top. And I bring you bring it already in the right zone. Means um, you don't see it over underexposed. You have everything in there. Because 
it's basically all there. Even if something's overexposed, you just bring the exposure down, you see it. But I will do this for you. I will give you one LUT, basically, already in the right color space, and then it's okay for you. And when you go out of, of Nuke, you render it again without the LUT, give it back to me, and it's 100% there. Does, does it make sense? A little bit, yeah, because in, in Unreal Engine, it's um, by default, it uses ACES. So when uh, whatever you're working, it uses ACES. So and, I um, must... T would be then uh, 1.1, 1.2, or uh, the gamma, or yeah, the the DRT basically the look which comes on top. So you probably can choose which kind of aces you want. Right. So the, I think we are stuck with um, it just says aces on the documentation here. Um, okay, that's that's probably the issue, and then everything gets too contrasty. Yeah, normally, yeah. Um, I can show you actually, um, just so you can uh, see the I difference. Mean, not knowing the Unreal Engine, but I, I can imagine because I know it from mostly the compositors are complaining about that. So, um, yeah, it does get more contrasty, and it's the same with Unity, uh, which I also used to work on. Is when you use Aces, everything is like very but contrasty, and then you have to figure know, out the way to deal with it. As I know, the Aces committee, uh, they're very clever engineers. They are working on something now um, to balance this a little bit out. There's an ACES to zero coming, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, you, should, you should invite Jay-Z, Jochen Sell, who is in, in the ACES board. Um, this guy is the top specialist. He's in the developer team. And well, really I will. Uh, you can connect me later, and uh, maybe yeah. we'll do that. So just to answer some of the questions for you, or you can answer for them as well, but I know the answer. So one question is, um, are you familiar with game engines like, like Unreal Engine or Unity? No, Would, sorry. No, no. So that's where we come in, uh, Florent. Uh, we, we have to kind of connect the dots and kind of explain a little bit. And that way we get good answers back. So now he knows Unreal Engine does has ACES. It has the same challenges. Um, and um, uh, hey, Morgan, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, so just to give you like uh, I can show you a visual example because then you have a bit more specific to to look at as well because uh, why not I only have one screen unfortunately because my other screen broke but I'll I'll show you in a minute um, I think you can well well, uh, well there it looks okay right on the screen I think it's not doubled or anything uh, yeah so yeah so so this is the filmic tone mapper in in for example unreal engine this is was the old one and then they added the ac standard by default so you know it gets all contrasty and uh, um yeah because aces has already a look baked in um the film light guys so the base light system that i'm working on they're trying a little bit of a different approach uh what they do they say yeah i want these 32 stops of dynamic range i want all the benefits but i don't want to look so they give you a very flat look and you then in the color grading tool or me, I can basically choose which kind of look I want and I can mix it. Right. So, but so you it, certainly can't do it, but this would be a good thing for, for the Unreal Engine actually. Maybe one of the developers is checking in right now. Yeah, because, you know, it, uh, it obviously has some limitation. You can you can opt out of ACES, I think, in the, in the like in the script command line. But, you know, we have some of the same basic features that you probably have in, in DaVinci Resolve. As I told you earlier, we often have to um, but edit stuff. You're not alone with that because this was a huge thing. I tried ACES in 2013, 13 and 14, and I hated it. Because the moment I switched my timeline in, um, everything went haywire, everything was too dark, and I said, that's crazy. And I, I didn't understand I have to go in, in color grain, you have to go out of the look. Because usually, you know, when you start from lock, you build up a look and you get more contrasty and you try to make a difference with masks and, and create depth. And suddenly I was in such a dark mood and I couldn't get out of it. And first in, in grading, I had to understand that, no, no, you can take out contrast, you can take out saturation because the look went basically a little bit too far. And this kind of shreked everyone away from using ACES um it takes a while to get used to it but the, i think what the main issue is there's too much look on top and it's not a matter if you if you're on a bright image but if you're already on a very dark image it makes it even darker and that's what a lot of vfx artists face so that's where i come in and give them basically a second look on top or a lot which balances out so you would say that the 
purpose of a lot is to counter the contrast that often occurs with ACs, which is, oh, unless you're intending to have it, it you would use a lot to kind of, okay, it's, in, it's too good. In, in this case, yes. Actually, I, I try to choose my look and not get a look already up front. And that's that's one of the issues of ACES. But I'm pretty sure, uh, as I heard, they're working on it to make it a little bit more flat and you can choose your look. So here you have like an example of uh, how our, our LUTs lo would look like, you know, the, these right. are how, uh, this is, you could also do it in Photoshop actually and then edit it, uh, which is what most people would do in, as a beginner before they go into DaVinci. And you have like a different um, LUT you can put in in the post-processing. Right. And right. you get the different looks, um, and then uh, I guess some of the terminologies is the same. In uh, you know, you know, for probably all of this, what it kind of means. But you can see it, this is the limit. These are kind of the stuff we can use in Unreal Engine, and then uh, we try and do our best in uh, in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, the more experienced people I know, they will go in DaVinci Resolve. They'll do like what you're saying, and then they will bring back into the engine afterwards to kind of deal with stuff. But actually, you should have these possibilities in the engine, in my opinion, to yes. choose what you want, right? We, we definitely should. Uh, and uh, Unity has uh, better color grading tools uh, because uh, it has some of the same... Um, the vector graph you have, like, for example, in, in uh, DaVinci Resolve, it has the stethoscope or whatever it's called. It has all of these different graphs, a good histogram as well. To kind of do the green. Yeah, hectoscope. But yeah, vectorscope. It the saturation and um, basically the colors around. So you can, I don't know, sh um, we don't have one in front of us now, but uh, let's say there's green and you see how far you're going into the green level. And if you're more in the center, there's less saturation. If you put saturation, it opens up. It's a vector right. school. Yeah. And um, so when it comes to, I think some of the biggest challenges the lighting artist has in engine and generally is overexposure, underexposure, getting the, the right values exposure in, and then also dealing with the fact that it's too dark or, or too bright, or do you, as you said earlier, highlights on, on, on stuff that you don't want. Um, um, coming back to your question before, what should you do? Um, if you have the full control to over underexpose, of course, don't do it. Keep it a little bit flat. Uh, sometimes on VFX, I mean, every project is different. I, I give them 80% contrast if I have to render a look in. Usually I try not to render a look in, but sometimes, you know, it's just a monitor insert or something, picture in picture, what they have to do. I give them 80% contrast and I, I leave some room that when it comes back, I can work on it. So if you render out of your engine only 70-80% uh, contrast and keep it actually more on the flatter side, then you take it in color grading later and just pump it up a little bit. Then you have a choice where you want to go and, and maybe take the highlights a little bit down, but the overall brighter. But if you go full in already on the render, then there's no more, nothing you can do. Hmm. So you're saying that, let's say I'm doing a render and I want to make sure I get the best possible grading out of it. I should uh, not do like a full, uh, fully completed render in the engine. I should kind of make the assumption that it should be a little flat and then you it's just make sure you... You give it some safety. That's actually what I tell the, the 3D artists, because in 3D, it's very hard to put a lot in and get the right uh, ACES version, especially if uh, I had a project where they had 3D characters a lot. And I tried to kind of make a workflow with the Maya guys and then later bring it in into Nuke. <clears throat> and it, I, we ended up, I, I made a lot for them, which kind of worked. It was not perfect, but it worked. Um, and it, it, I remember it was two, three years ago and it was, it was hard in, in Maya. But then I told him, just keep it a bit flatter. Don't make the final look in Maya, because you're taking every step behind, basically, the range. Makes sense. Um, I don't have all the, my files anymore, I see. I was hoping to pull up DaVinci Resolve and uh, show you some of the stuff more visually. So what are the, some of the things? You have the, you have the uh, waveform, you have the vector scope, you have the parade. Um, yeah. What are some of the things? Because I've heard different things, and I don't, I'm not really sure. I'm going to share the screen just so people can see what we're talking about. It's it's broken because I deleted the file, so I can't actually do a lot about it. But I think it will help um, if I just yeah, I'll explain it. Just pull it up, then I can explain it to you. 
uh, I'll just share the screen. Uh, obviously, it's broken. So this stuff, right? You have an image, and if you were to edit it, so uh, in a, in a nutshell, the the parrot, which is the upper left with the three bars, red, green, blue. So what you see on the lower bottom is the blacks. Everything on the bottom is the blacks. So if you put make the image darker, you crash the blacks. You pull it under zero. So um and basically the lowest parts rgb if they are in balance at the same level you have clean blacks like i should have a clean black right now if you put too much red in the red would be a little bit higher if i put too much blue in the blue would be higher and i have blue blacks so that's the kind of thing uh, what i would do in the beginning i balance it and i try not to crash the blacks too much so i keep them kind of at the zero point even then try to make a, a nice curve, maybe with my LUT, but it's some 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 color grading thing. And on the highlights, it's exactly the same. The top part is the highlights. Um, yeah, so RGB. So the top, if you point with your mouse, doesn't work with my fingers, sadly, uh, left side. Uh, here, here. No, here. the RGB. This one, yes, 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 the RGB. So the top part is the highlights. Right. So if you go higher and higher and higher with your grading, you overexpose. So to a point where you literally clip the highlights um, to the point of no return. So try to always keep it in balance. And then again, the same thing. If your red is too high, there's too much warmth in your highlights. If the blue is too high, your highlights getting blue. Um, I think there are some good tutorials on YouTube where you can learn this stuff. Because And then basically everything in the middle part, that's gamma. And the gamma is influencing everything. It's like a like a, a rubber band. So on in the gamma basic, you make your color toning. You want it warm, you want it cold. But the highlights in black, you usually try to keep them balanced. Not too much tinting in the in the black or so in the shadow. You can a little bit is okay if you want this style. But the rest you do in gamma, and in gamma you basically you you make it a bit brighter, darker. That's the easy explanation now. So so what is there a best practice on like the blacks and the highlight and keeping because i know one person um might say uh keep this in in the middle like from depends on depends on the image um can't say see what what i do and what i learned right in the beginning now i have a kind of different approach after 15 years but um i would balance the blacks i would balance the highlights if they're not already balanced uh, try to not under and overexpose or crash the blacks and highlights and then the middle part use the middle part the gamma or the midtones just to make it a bit brighter a bit darker wherever you want to go squeeze the signal a little bit compress it and maybe if you want it warmer you push it from the midtones to warm or you push it to cool or wherever you want to go um and you know what you can of course now people will ask what what's a lot what are you doing with a lot um, a LUT basically gives you already a look. The issue now is if you use a LUT on your footage, the LUT might be too strong. So either you fade it in or you use the LUT maybe if you don't have the technical experience in, in, in the wrong color space. So suddenly your image, which is nice, is going crazy. And then you have to try to get out. That's also what happens to a lot of young colorists. They use a standard LUT, which are orange and teal, which they think is nice. But then they have problems getting out of this LUT. So that's why I say be careful with LUTs. Um, everything, keep it from your render in a, in a safe space. You can use a LUT. You can use also two LUTs in a combination, but one per per, per show or per your entire timeline, not 15. And um, then do a little bit of color grading. And I think there's some some good tutorials out there. So that's, that's good. Um, so basically, it, it can vary a little bit what what do you need to do per project some people might actually want contrast i'm guessing you know and some people uh, might not want it um so what are your thoughts on is there any practice that is like un, that should be avoided regardless of project uh because uh, you know when you do filming normally um a lot of cinematographers they prefer to either underexpose or overexpose for different reasons um which obviously gonna affect the color grading as well um, is this like a problem for you when you work or are you already aware of these things or is that's it a different definitely. workflow? Yeah, that, that's that's why I go on sets on a professional set. 
um, you try to control everything. It's not always possible, but what I usually do, I give the DOP on set a lot, which is one stop darker. So it's really one, you know, stop. Yeah. Kind of. It's one stop darker. So this helps because on the monitor, I see then if something is too dark, because now I bring it down. Um, if something's too dark, we need more light or we really want it to be dark. And I protect my highlights because I see now that I give the highlights a little bit more range. If they're still overexposing to a clipping point, then it's too much. Then I have to, I don't know, dim down the window or do things. Um, on a semi-professional level, you can just take care not to overexpose, not to underexpose, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so when you look at the piece uh, image, like in, in th that we just did in Da Vinci, is there... Um... So mostly you would pay attention if it's a good image generally, even if it's not color graded, you would say you're not over clipping or you're not black clipping or you're white clipping. So you're not overexposing or uh, underexposing. It's more or less balanced overall. And that is by default, at least a good basic image for you and, and anyone to work with. What about the histogram? Is that like any in your experience? Because you have obviously looked at a lot of movies and, and the TV show and there's you looked at a lot of histograms. Is there like a, an obvious type of histogram that suggest this is this is a good histogram it has all the information you need or this is a bad histogram okay, you're, you're very technical now basically to be frank i don't use the histogram now after so many years so much i just I, I, have monitors, I just make a quick uh, quick check okay down yeah right space the rest in my now after so many years of experience are you i'm on my feeling like Okay, this looks nice here, a little bit more to that. And quick check on the histogram. For someone who begins, um, let's start on the shoot. Of course, a histogram or a signal should be well balanced, let's say. Um, it shouldn't be that there are super holes in there because, I don't know, you don't use the full signal. So everything's underexposed, everything's overexposed. But then I think it's, it's just the thing with your eyes, like um, your lighting technique. What kind of lighting are you using? Are you using light rays? Are you um, building up your set or your image? Doesn't matter in real or in in, in the Unreal Engine. Um, how are you building up your layers? How you're building up your depth? Is there enough background? Is something still visible in the background? Is the background too bright in the character in front? Let's let's use me. Um, I think this is not a very pleasing image right now. So usually I would cut the light here and maybe put a little bit more light in the background. Those are lighting techniques. And I think the lighting techniques, they give, later give you a good signal or help you with a nice look. I, me as a colorist, I can just I enhance it. I can fix some things to a level, but I can never make gold out of shit. That's what I want to say. Yeah, makes sense. So, um... Flor Florent is agreeing with our conversation and that what we said earlier is Unreal Engine feels very limited for color grading internally. There's a lot more option in Resolve, but Unreal Engine doesn't accept 3D LUTs. So we have mm. to stick with Unreal Engine if we're working with HDR. That's, um, that's what he's saying. So let's talk about HDR because you were kind of mentioning that indirectly. So how does that work? What's the difference? What do you have to be aware of when you're work uh, working with HDR TV, HDR screen, I suppose? A lot of people get confused what's HDR. So like there's the shooting technique HDR, which you have on an iPhone or even a red camera has HDR. But the HDR, what I'm talking about is the HDR, which comes in post-production, which happens only in post-production. So uh, for example, Adobe Vision or HDR 10, HDR 10 plus, um, um, or a highlight log gamma. So those things, they're happening only in post-production and you need an HDR monitor. So whenever someone tells me, oh, I'm shooting in HDR. No, you're not shooting in HDR. Also not with your iPhone, you're shooting in HDR. You probably shoot one over and one underexposed and combine it. This happens in, in when people say they shoot with a camera in HDR. Every camera, professional camera, with more than 12 stops of dynamic range is kind of considered to have the enough capability to be in HDR. So the... So Till HDR monitors came out, basically we were working in SDR, which is uh, then the color space Rec 79. So you had an SDR monitor at home. You, it doesn't matter how you shoot it, it will be SDR. Now we have the possibility um, to have HDR monitors. 
and uh, me in post-production have a HDR monitor. So that's why, remember when I said first, I want a scene-referred color timeline. I don't want a display-referred one. Display-referred means I'm limiting it to the output. So if I'm limiting it to SDR, I can never get out of this anymore. doesn't matter what I do because I'm limited in my timeline. So what I'm doing is I'm opening this timeline. It's scene-referred. It doesn't matter what output I have later. If I have a SDR, HDR, if I have cinema color space, if I have sRGB for the gamers, I then can choose according my output. So the first thing you have to understand is basically HDR happens on the monitor or in post-production. So then you gamers, of course, or Unreal guys, you have um, HDR lighting where you take an EXR and you create a sphere and take the whole dynamic range of this lighting EXR uh, or HDR image and light the scene. But then the problem is you see it in SDR again on your sRGB monitor. So now is a question for you, actually. Can you go from Unreal Engine, go directly on HDR monitor and display 1,000 nits HDR? If you don't do it quickly, it looks shit on the SDR. Let me put it this way. We did a project. I came in very late. No one told me we we're going to do an SDR monitor. I look at the product on the SDR. I'm like, this is fucked up. This this is not good at all because no one was looking at the SDR when doing the working or telling me because I didn't light it for the SDR. I, I lit it for a, a RGB a color range and, and, and you know, for and, an SDR. And you, when you light it, you have to see it in HDR. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what you're doing. Exactly. So the output is going to be, unfortunately, wrong. <laughs> so... So and then the standard now is you have thousand nits. So nits is is you could say brightness. SDI is hundred nits. HDI is one thousand nits, but not over the whole image. That's the thing. Uh, only your highlights. So it's, uh, that's it's a huge misunderstanding what colorists, especially in the beginning, had. And they said, okay, everything now have HDI. Everything has to be fucking bright, and uh, kind of you get eye cancer when you see the stuff. <laughs> so you need sunglasses. But that's not HDR. HDR should enhance your image. It's just a tool. Mm -hmm. So your look is still the same. It looks filmic, it looks dark, it looks moody. Uh, and if you switch between SDR and HDR, and I often do the test with, with cinematographers. They go out and I switch it. and say, ah, oh, it looks nice. And I say, yeah, this is HDR now. And they say, no. I say, yes, because the look is the same. Just the highlights are more brilliant and you have more details in the blacks. Mm -hmm. that's but there are a couple of things you can't do in HDR. This is overexposing to a clipping point on the shoot or in the render. Because what happens now that the highlights are not 100 nits, so you don't see the difference. The highlights now, the top highlight, the peak highlights on your glasses now, for example, they are 1,000 nits. So they really come out. So let's say 10, 15% of the image should have the full 1,000 nits uh, capability, not everything. And now that they come fully out, you basically see a white block when you overexpose to a clipping point or overclipping. Um, but now I lost it. But I think that's it. That's that's HDR. And then you have different versions, different flavors of HDR, like like Dolby Vision. Um, but if you want to make HDR, you have to see it in HDR. And what what I do on set, for example, um, I try to help and support the DOPs. Because they didn't shoot for HDR. They don't shoot in HDR, they shoot for HDR. And for HDR means you shoot exactly like, like before, you just take care of your highlights, that the ratio is right. So if there would be a window behind me um, and the window is super bright, doesn't matter how bright my face is, everyone would concentrate on this huge window behind me. Because now this window is 10 times brighter. So um, I'm telling you, please see the ratio between your face. And the window behind should be, in my opinion, maximum of two stops. So it can be two stops brighter, but then it gets, I pr could probably bring it down, but it doesn't look nice anymore. It doesn't look pleasing. Um, kind of that thing. So like I, I told you, uh, I check the monitors and I dim down the monitors. I dim down tube lights because they take all the attention because they are in this upper range. So if we have zero nits, thousand nits, which should be only the little glossy highlights. And then you have, let's say, 400 to 600 nits where the face should be. And then the image looks amazing because then it looks pleasing, it's not too bright. Um, but coming back to this, you have to see it in HDR the moment you, you work on it. Make sense? Yep. Uh, I think it was very useful. Um, 
I still skins are not really cheap though. Most of them are pretty, uh, pretty especially cheap. the professional ones. Um, uh, my monitor here is around, th I think, my slide 25 to 30 thousand dollars, something. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, at work, I use it as a screen, I think it's a screen as mm -hmm. as IO brand, you know, it's it's uh, has it's meant for color grading actually. Um, but uh, I didn't have an SGR screen, uh, so that's, that's another thing. Also, uh, you can do the nicest grading and color, but if your monitor is not calibrated and you don't see your colors right, you will have I don't know what screen later green blood instead of red blood. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about color range and, and screens. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Uh, in terms of uh, is it sRGB and all those these Adobe RGB, all of these things? Um, it's color spaces specifically, I'm talking okay, about. So, um, if you go on TV, the TV color space is Rec 709, or now they call it uh, Rec 1886, actually, but it's basically it's the same. The gamma is 2.4, that's the brightness. So um, usually computer monitors or phones, they have, they, they are on sRGB. The difference is your color primaries, like, you know, this, this triangle where your defines your color is exactly the same between Rec. 709, so the TV color space and the computer color space. What's different is the gamma and the gamma on, on displays, which are not TV is 2.2. So that's it's a big discussion for years because me, for example, I work in 2.4. I give it on a monitor and or the guy watches it on the phone and says, yeah, but it's it's too dark or it's too bright because he's always watching it with another gamma. So that's the one thing. But uh, I would stick in your we have case. The same, we have the same problem because people don't have. Yeah, because people are not. We don't know if the consumer is color graded. We don't know if they're playing on a what screen. I've been facing this shit for the last 20 years, <laughs> where at one point in Germany, I remember this, they stopped the shoot because the dailies, the rushes, which I was basically doing in analog still on, on film, they were looking like shit. And we figured out, I mean, they stopped it. They were shooting in Morocco, in another country. And oh, and you know, I was a young guy, one of my first jobs. I said, fuck, my career is over. <laughs> and so, so we figured out, I made the rushes from film. I put it on a Beta SP, uh, which was an analog tape kind of. It was looking good. It was a kind of extreme look, but the DOP wanted it like that. Then they digitized it in an early version of Avid. I mean, this was around 2005, 6. Um, digitized it in whatever codec. No one till today, I don't know which codec. Then they uploaded it to Morocco, and the guy was watching it in 480 on a on a laptop in the sun, which whatever color space. So of course, everything which is already extreme got more and more and more and more shit with every step, and they stopped the shoot until someone came in and said, "Yeah, okay, it looks okay." So <laughs> that's what you think. This I'm facing this for the last 20 years. So what's your recommendation though uh, for that? Because obviously, even though even though you're a colorist, we are lighting artists, we're still doing, you know, we're lighting, we're basically right. director photographer, we are a gaffer, director photographer, right. and a color, colorist. We have to understand um, all of this. What, 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 what I'm doing, um, first of all, the monitor has to get calibrated. Um, and you will see every TV, doesn't matter if the TVs they're produced at the same minute, they will all look different. Because all their chips are a little bit different, so they also come with the wrong setting. But your monitor has to get calibrated and not with this little whatever probes spend a little bit of money on a better monitor which is good to calibrate because not all monitors you can calibrate this is number one and then i personally don't go try not to go too extreme in a look because i can't control where people are seeing it are they seeing it on an oppo phone on an iphone on a which iphones are quite okay um on an ipad on whatever cheap television so in the worst case, it multiplies, you know, and it gets more extreme and more dark and more bright. And so I try to kind of keep it in a okay look, but not to the extreme where I'm crashing things because it might always multiply. Mm. So, cause I think I am working on, and I think my color space is SRGB seven something, something, right? Uh, 
yeah i mean it does it it's a factory calibrated from 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 professionally from a zero and then i calibrate it every every month i calibrate because if the lights are on and the lighting changes i change the calibration because the light affects the screen and the glare and what i look at um, that's a good thing um what I, what I do i my environment okay that, that's interesting actually um so you know the magic hour like magic magic hour the hell. Oh, outside yeah. yeah yeah you know when basically some there's still some there's not enough sun so and that's where both your yourselves the cones and the rods are activated you have the same atmosphere in a cinema like this because the front screen is bright but at the same time it's dark so both your cells are activated it's the only time where both your cells are activated to a maximum and uh, so when you're in a complete dark room you wouldn't have this so I try in every grading room, actually, a professional grading room tries to have a light in front, uh, which is not reflecting on the monitor, but is uh, must lie now. I think it's 6,500 Kelvin. And there are companies who, who measure it, also they give you the right grayish wall color. And this is a very subtle light, neutral, of course, not red or blue light, because then you would go contra. Um, but this is helping so much because it's, it's balancing you. Also, the other tip is like make breaks, go out every 20, 30 minutes, especially in the morning, because it's exhausting and your eyes are getting used to this stuff. See, I, I remember one of my first jobs back in Germany. Um, my boss comes in and tells me, um, so do you like your image, what you're doing right now? And so, yeah, it looks, looks awesome. And he's like, go out. So I, I went out. I come back after 10 minutes. Everything is magenta. It looks like shit. <laughs> I did this for one hour because I got used to what I'm seeing there. And then after a while, it looks good, you know, because your eyes are adjusting. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh, do, do your look, but then go out and come back. And the second thing which I'm telling every young colorist and assistants when they're here, um, make five looks very quick. Make seven looks, save them. Because when you work, let's say, 20 minutes on one look and you think it's awesome, it's amazing. And uh, you get stuck to this. But if you have five looks and you build them up from scratch, the number one look, which you think is the most amazing in the world, it maybe looks like shit. And number four is the right one. So uh, I'm trying to understand a question, which I am unable to understand because it's, it's a mix of questions. Okay. Uh, um, he's asking in Maya working with ACs, color config does normal map, roughness map, height map, metallic map, which are the textures we use on, on our 3D objects. Filtering should change from sRGB to raw. Um, at, at which point sRGB to raw? What, what, is, what is he having in his, his scene? If so, no. normally, when we do, I think I'm starting to understand this question maybe a little bit. Um, uh, normally when we import and export things in an engine anyway um, we have to make sure it's uh, calibrated for srgb if it's meant for screens otherwise it's the issues basically and i think he's asking that question um but i cannot give him a clear answer because i think he's mixing aces the, the, the textures and and srgb as, as, uh, as the same thing i mean I, I will translate it in my grading language um, so there are three, four different positions where you can screw the color spaces. The one is when you bring in the footage, because you have to tell this is a raw footage, this is a log footage, this is already Rex on the line, whatever. You have to know this. Uh, some tools, they automatically see it's, it's let's say, Rex on the line. Then you choose your timeline, which is basically your working color space. And this can be ACES, this can be something. And then is your output color space. Your output color space is basically your monitor. So if you are working on a on a computer monitor, it's S sRGB. If you work on a television, it's Rec 709. So and all those more or less have to be aligned. So if you, for example, take it in with the wrong color space, it will look already weird. Then you use it in the wrong working space, um, sRGB you limit it instead of ACES or something. And then you go out on the wrong color space on the wrong monitor. And then you completely screwed up. Yeah, and that's kind of what we have to do as well for our materials. We have to normally we use sRGB because that's mostly uh, the correct that's one. Safe for you guys, and then ACES basically is 
I assume because I didn't use my Maya for more than 20 years. Um, um, basically, I think you have a working space also where you work in. And this is an ACES, which again on top gives you a look. So then, yeah, um, for, for Maya, you know, uh, I don't know if he knows it, um, but uh, a lot of people when they work in Maya, they struggle a lot with the when they look at the image and then they render it and then they save the image and they go, why is it darker or brighter? That's because they didn't do the gamma correction, which is normally 2.4 is what you would uh, override basically. But I think people get confused about the ACES, the sRGB, the raw, the gamma. I don't, it's really a conversation we probably should get deeper into another time as well. The thing is, but that's really, I, you should connect and I will connect you to the, to the ACES guys itself. Um, Cause this, that's a thing they're dealing daily with. So what yeah. I can say, for example, if I make a cinema, that's it's very interesting. So I work for cinema and I have a gamma of 2.6. So it's a very dark gamma. Um, but your computer monitor, VFX, is 2.2. So you see the difference. It's not even the difference between 2.2 and 2.4, which I have with TV and computer monitors. It's 2.6. So if I give you now an image of, from 2.6 and you watch it on 2.2, there's something off. So what I usually try, if I work for cinema, I try to bring it on 2.4 in the right colors. We, we learned before sRGB and Rec. 709 is very close color-wise. And bring it closer to your gamma so that what you see later, and I bake this in a look or in a LUT. Give you this LUT so the, the compositing guys, basically, they see very close to what I see on, on the big screen. Doesn't yeah, basically. Yeah, and I think that's uh, something a lot of people are not informed about just yet, because uh, we get a lot of questions like it doesn't look right, it looks wrong, and often it's just uh, this. I wouldn't say it's simple, but you know, it's these basic things like sRGB, different monitor. Are you look? Are you testing it on your phone? Are you testing it on your TV? Is it how old is your TV? <laughs> it's also good to know. The same thing. If if you work in Asus, you put a, Asus has a lot baked in. Um, if you go on then render it as a final, you will bake in this LUT. If you render it as a VFX format like EXRs and give it back to me in color grading, you don't bake the ACES LUT usually in. A, so if you render it as ACES, but not with the ACES look. Yeah, so in, in the case of um, in Maya, you have to decide everything yourself. You have to be aware of the same thing you have to be aware of because you have to be aware of, okay, what's the input, what's the output, and you can control the gamma and everything. And you have to check it as well. Uh, when you use it on Unreal Engine, we can we can turn off ACES on the script line, as far as I remember, but normally by default it's ACES, so, so it should look correct. Uh, on, I mean, on, on... Let's, let's be frank, the, the big companies, frames to double negative and, and, and those sorts, they have teams who, who take care of the color management. Yeah. Who really dive in and, and program and try to fix those things. That's not, not easy stuff. Really not easy stuff. No, it's not. And I just wanted to, because you mentioned like light in the background. I do have one that I keep in the background. That's uh, exactly that. But this is a, a little bit brighter. It's 10,000 lumens. So it's uh, the same as the. Don't talk it. <laughs> yeah, like it's a. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have any UV, it's UV protected and everything as well, but I do keep it around as well. But yeah, I just want to show at least one of your videos uh, as well, um, one of your work, um, just so people can have a context as well. Uh, do, 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 do. I can... So we show Choked, Patala, The Lady of Heaven, The Prisoner, or The TVC Bike, Abu Dhabi. These are the ones I downloaded already. Uh, choked is, I thought the color grading is choked is cool, so maybe go go for that one. It's in HDR, but you're seeing the SDR version now. Uh, well, I guess it's a learning lesson, then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk about that as well if we have to. Let's have a look. <laughs> Hey, 
हफ्ते में तीसरी बार आलू खिला रही है पनीर वनीर खिलाया करो कभी आलू को आलू ही खिलाऊंगी ना पनीर खाना है तो पनीर बनो <laughs> तो असली है सरिता लेकिन आपको डाउट क्यों है पानी की तरह पैसा बहा रही है सरिता कहां से आ रहे ये पैसे कौन दे रहा है बस गया। लड़ गया। लड़ गया। लड़ गया। फाइव हंड्रेड रुपी एंड थाउजेंड रुपी करेंसी नोट विल नो लॉन्गर बी लीगल टेंडर अब देखना सारा ब्लैक में निकल के आएगा बाहर देखा उसका मन कहा लगा रहा है ये देख दिखा दियो ना मैं अब तो काम नहीं कर सकती मैंने आपको Choked, pesa bolta, which basically means choked. Uh, money talks. If anyone was curious about the title name, um, I'm going to show also the other one because it's a different color grading and it's interesting to see the differences. Uh, the prisoner. Am I, is it okay to show the prisoner? Because I don't know if if it's sure. something publicly. Um, well, everything on my my website, themeo.com/slash/colorgrading. Um, it's it's all public. Cool. Uh, because um, sometimes um, I'm sure YouTube is gonna flag all of this end of the video as as copyright issues. But I'll. قم بالتعتيم على خططك يا ليل الأعشاب. ماني مرتاح لوجوده ما بعرف شو عن جنرال ولك انا بحرق الدنيا كلها كرمال الجنرال شو بدهم بواحد ميت انه المسؤول الوحيد عن كل الجرائم هو الوزير سليمان عتيق Second show where I was a creative director, on. and the the idea we had was like, okay, you produce something which say would look or would cost fifty million dollars for under two million dollars, and this was under two million dollars. We shot it in in Beirut, and by actually going so much in pre-production and uh, working on production technology, working on the creative design, and have the look basically already established in, in the pre-production. That's what we did. So it wouldn't be possible just to take the stuff, later grade it. No, we really worked on it in pre-production, and that's how we, we got to this result here. Yeah. That's nice. And uh, do you often use the color grading from other movies as a template that you store in David to resolve? Is any time uh, you go like, okay, this works here, let's just take it over? No, no, this wouldn't work. Um, you mean from my other movies? Yeah, because I know some people are color. I know there's a way to store all of your grading in in DaVinci Resolve, right? And then you can go like, okay, I want yeah, this tone. Uh, no, no. What I do, I always build it up from scratch for my projects, uh, because 
you know, I work specifically on skin tones. I want the right compression on something. I want um, different shades to be in a, in a certain way. So this takes me actually the longest time on a grade then to build up this, I would call it film look or film negative. And once I have it, I have the right combination. This really takes me a bit. And I spend sometimes two days, three days only on this combination, how the skin tone should be right. And, and then I use this on the whole film. So it's always individual for the project. Hmm. That's cool. So I snuck in another 11 minutes with Andreas. Technically, we were finished uh, one, uh, 11 minutes ago, so we're not going to drag it out for, but there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of information here. So I took the opportunity to drag it out a little bit more. Uh, but thank you, Andreas. Uh, we will be uh, ending the stream now. And just a reminder for everyone else, um, you can uh, go to... Uh, I can share his link in the in in, in the description if anyone want to look at some more of his videos. He's done a lot of work. I mean, uh, if you have any any more uh, comments, any more questions, we can do it now. Yeah, if there's any final questions, as someone uh, has, um, just comments. You know, color grading is a complicated topic for sure. I think we learned that today. There's a lot to learn. Uh, you know, most most good colorists uh, that I've heard from so far have told me. It takes you know five years up to five years at least to be like a really master color grading and understand my, my it. assistants are learning for four years yeah. the first is just technical stuff and uh, at least four years and uh, so but that's an interesting topic as some said earlier today i don't know if i uh, posted the comment earlier uh, but someone was saying you know um it's uh color grading is important for slicing artists you know, we need to understand it. We need to understand color moods. We didn't talk about too much about that, but uh, maybe another time we'll, we'll dig deep uh, in regards to that. Um, if someone has some question, uh, it's a good time. While someone thinks about some questions, here's a reminder for everyone who is watching and uh, maybe new. We do have some portfolio reviews. If you want to review your work, you can always do that and let us know. If you want to be highlighted, you know you have to be active in the, in the community and we will promote you uh, as such. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of things. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit about lighting for games, you know we do have a course at courses.lightingbot.com. And who knows, maybe a color grading uh, tutorial might pop up in the future. <laughs> um, and also, we have tons of interviews from different people, you know, different industries. Be sure to watch them all. Um, we are planning a lighting challenge. So you, maybe you can use your color grading knowledge, prepare ahead of time, and kind of improve that stuff as well. And yeah, we also have lighting mentorship. And of course, during the lighting mentorship, Anything I learned, such as from Andreas, uh, I do also pass on in the lighting mentorship. So color grading, post grading, all of this stuff. I spent a lot of time learning this stuff as well, as well so I can uh, pass it on. Um, and that's about it. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit with Andreas in private just to get like a close it and and uh, get his feedback on, on this stream. And then I will let him go on with his important work. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your time and your energy. And uh, as usual, I appreciate everyone's time. And Andreas, really, I am quite um, uh, appreciative for your time as well, obviously. That thank you. Took the that time. was nice. It was really interesting, I think, uh, as, as, as everyone else is saying as well, um, really useful. And I really want to have more conversations with you about these topics over a long period of time. So thank you. And everyone, thank you again. If you have any future questions, you know, just leave it on the comment, fill in the YouTube video as well. Uh, have a nice day. Have